26 years in prison for disobedience to the Ortega government. A Nicaraguan bishop hears his fate after he refuses to board a flight to freedom. Coming up, more about the priest who chose to remain with his flock in the face of religious persecution. Benedict was rock solidly convinced that he would die before the end of 2013, after his resignation. This month marks the 10th anniversary of papal sea change, when Pope Benedict XVI resigned. We travel to his boyhood home in Germany to dig into the question of why. I'm Alan Holdren in Oklahoma City, where America's first native-born priest to be martyred and beatified, Stanley Rother, has been moved to this shrine that bears his name. That story ahead. And surrounded by nature's beauty, we celebrate the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes at a peaceful grotto built in her honor. EWTN News In Depth starts now. The repression, the, the, the war on the Catholic Church and other, you know, religious uh, people, it shows no sign of letting up. Religious persecution in Nicaragua at the hands of President Daniel Ortega comes to a head with a long prison sentence for a leading Catholic bishop in the largest Central American country. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. The harsh sentence for Bishop Rolando Alvarez comes as the Nicaraguan government increasingly cracks down on dissidents. Persecuted for his religious commitment to human rights, the bishop was convicted on charges of spreading false information and helping anti-government protesters. He refused a flight to freedom with 222 other political prisoners released to the United States last week. Reporter Mark Irons explains. Greeted in the U.S. after they were exiled from Nicaragua. Catholic priests and seminarians given humanitarian protection in America now being welcomed into Catholic church communities, including in Charlotte and Miami. These are not rogue priests who, who are calling for, you know, violent uprisings. All they did wrong was to... Uh, speak out against the regime. The priests transported along with Nicaraguan activists, journalists, and politicians, more than 200 of them in total, all political prisoners flown to the U.S. a week ago. They were sentenced in Nicaragua and many spent time in jail after criticism of their government under President Daniel Ortega. Ortega has referred to the prisoners as traitors whom he wanted banished from the country. As he's a dictator. It's a flagrantly undemocratic government. Very extremely corrupt. Javier Pena works with Outreach Aid to the Americas. The Miami-based group has been advocating for basic freedoms in Nicaragua for years. While the U.S. agreed to receive the Nicaraguan prisoners, one of them, Bishop Rolando Alvarez, refused to leave. He's insisted that he's staying there, he's not going anywhere. Uh, he wants to be with, with his people. In Nicaragua, Bishop Alvarez has been charged as a traitor of the homeland. On house arrest since last August, he begins a new sentence, 26 years in prison. I think he's somebody who clearly has counted the cost, right, of, of following, of being a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus. Cardinal Leopoldo Brenes in the Nicaraguan capital of Managua was asked what can be done for Bishop Alvarez. Pray, he says, pray that the Lord gives him strength. The Cardinal said hate and resentment must not exist in the hearts of Christians. Pope Francis said the news from Nicaragua grieves him. He's praying for the prisoners transported to the U.S., all those suffering in the Central America country. Monsignor Rolando Alvarez. And the Holy Father expressed concern for Bishop Alvarez, whom he said he deeply cares for. Under the Ortega regime, hostility to the Catholic Church has been widespread. Catholic radio stations have been shut down. Last year, the Vatican's ambassador in Nicaragua was expelled from the country, and nuns with the Missionaries of Charity, the religious order founded by Mother Teresa, were kicked out as well. Good afternoon. At the U.S. State Department, officials hope the political prisoners' release will bring about change. The release of these individuals by the government of Nicaragua marks a constructive step towards addressing the human rights abuses in that country. When EWTN News In-Depth reached out to the Nicaraguan embassy in Washington for comment on the prisoners' release, no response was given. As for the bishop sentenced to 26 years in prison, Assistant Secretary of State Brian Nichols tweeted this week, 
we continue to call for Bishop Alvarez's release. For some of the freed prisoners who arrived in the U.S., the road ahead is unclear. The Nicaraguan government has voted to strip them of their citizenship, but some say they will continue to fight for democracy from afar. I love my country. And Juan Sebastian Chamorro was a presidential hopeful in Nicaragua. So was Felix Maradiaga. He ran in the country's 2021 presidential election. Both were political opponents to Ortega, but like others, they were arrested before the vote, clearing the field for the Nicaraguan president, easing his path to remain in power. What's next is to work for the establishment of a free and democratic Nicaragua in which uh, nobody, nobody ever again will be, be put in prison because of the things that we say. President Ortega paints a very different picture. No estamos pidiendo... He refers to the released prisoners as terrorists. Opposition to his regime grew after widespread protest in 2018. Thousands of people went to the streets, took to the streets to protest the, the government. But the government brutally suppressed the opposition. Not long after the protest in early 2019, we met two migrants from Nicaragua, Esperanza and her son, waiting on the Mexican side of the U.S. border near Brownsville, Texas. They had traveled from Nicaragua to seek asylum in the U.S. Esperanza told me they fled for their lives after supporting families who had suffered at the hands of the Nicaraguan government. She said by giving aid to others, she then became a target. Pope Francis has now entrusted Nicaragua to the intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. He's praying to the Lord that through her intercession, the hearts of political leaders and citizens may be open to peace. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. Former U.S. Representative and current Commissioner at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Frank Wolf, joins us now to give us a better understanding of what's happening in Nicaragua right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start off with why. Why do you think Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega released the prisoners? Well, I think it was a sign of weakness, number one. Number two, you, sir, and the State Department and many others have been pushing and pushing or Ortega, and I think he sort of felt an obligation to, to do it. But keep in mind, I just saw a re report that yesterday, 94 additional people were stripped of their, of, of their citizenship. It's so I, I think the, I also saw a report. <laughs> One human rights activist said yesterday, he said, the country, Nicaragua, is on the verge of becoming the Western Hemisphere's equivalent of North Korea. Uh, I admire Bishop Alvarez, the fact that he would not leave. I think that took a lot of courage. I mean, that was so strong of him. Ortega has done this before. Ortega did this back in the 80s. He's recreating and coming back. Keep in mind, too, China is now involved down there in, in, in Nicaragua. So I think it's important for the Congress to hold here hearings, not hearings just about what's going on, but on what they should be doing about it. Secondly, I think there ought to be a gathering of all the groups that care deeply about Nicaragua and also Cuba to come up with a policy and actually things that you can do to change what's going on down there in Nicaragua. A regional approach. Well, let's talk about what you were saying, pushing and pushing. Let's tease out some of that. The U.S. has placed sanctions on Ortega, multiple Nicaraguan officials and on industries to block U.S. companies from investing in Nicaragua. Is this enough? No, it's not enough because you're seeing he's actually getting getting any worse. I think you have to do a comprehensive thing. But I think you need congressional hearings to bring some of these people in to testify. These are patriots. They want to go back to Nicaragua. They Many still have family back there to come over the constructive thing of what you can, can do. It's just not enough to have a press release or the State Department to say something. I think you have to have a policy. We were able to, Pope John Paul, who frankly should have gotten the, the Nobel Prize for the defeat of communism, he and Ronald Reagan brought down communism in Poland and Romania. I think the church working with the, those who care deeply about this, we can bring about a change. But USERF has been speaking out, advocating for it. But I think the Congress has to get involved. But people who really understand what's going on have to help educate the Congress educate the administration on what can be done to actually change the government. And you just called Bishop Alvarez courageous. He turned down the opportunity to be released to the U.S. As Catholics, we see a leader who's staying with his flock. What message does this send to Ortega, a former guerrilla leader who campaigned on anti-church sentiment? 
I think it sends a very strong message that the Catholic Church and he is an individual are very strong. Also, it sends a message to, to the flock. It sends a message to religious leaders all over, all over the world. So I think it's a very courageous thing. He could have gotten on the plane. He could have gotten on the plane with the other 222 land at Dulles Airport we live in in McLean or in Miami now, but he didn't do it. And so I really commend him. I think it's a strong action. But I think now in order to encourage him, I think the United States government and all the groups have to do more than just say this is a bad thing. There has to be a policy as to change what's going on. Ortega has done this before. This is not the first time the Ortega and his wife have done these, these things. Any government that expels a missionary of charities, Mother Teresa's group, is not a good government. Now, you mentioned the stripping of citizenship. In addition to 26 years in prison, they also stripped the, uh, the bishop of his Nicaraguan citizenship. How does this complicate things, or, or is this just an effort to further humiliate him? I think it's just an effort to humiliate him, and I think Ortega's being, being a bully. Don't forget, the Sandinistas in the past, Ortega has done this be before. This is not the, I remember once going down to meeting with, with Ortega back in the late, late, late 80s. Ortega has a history of doing these, these things. And now I think there's some other thing we have to realize. China is now involved down there in Nicaragua. And China is up to no good in Nicaragua. China is up to no good in Cuba. And China is up to no good in many other places around, around the world. But I think a strong, almost the way that Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul did with regard to communism in Poland, communism in Romania, we can do this. And this is in our own hemisphere. You can get on an airplane in Washington and be in Nicaragua in a couple couple hours. You can have lunch in Washington and dinner in, 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 in Nicaragua. We have an obligation to the people of Nicaragua to do something. Lastly, you almost have a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. China is involved in Cuba. Cuba's 90 miles off our, our coast. You can, it's like going from Washington to Wilmington. I mean, and the same thing with regard to the foreign governments getting involved down in Nicaragua. There needs to be a, po a policy, a bipartisan policy. The Congress has to come together and hold hearings to educate people, but also to educate members of Congress. The last thing I would encourage, I think it'd be very helpful for a congressional delegation, Republicans and Democrats, to on the next recess break, it's not very far. It's sometimes it's closer to Nicaragua than to their own congressional district to go down and see firsthand, ask to go into the prison to meet with Bishop uh, Alvarez. Wouldn't it be great to have three Republicans and three Democrats to go down to uh, Nicaragua land, tell Ortega they want to go in and meet the bishop in, in, in prison to meet with the dissidents? That would be something very powerful. Lastly, there needs to be a convening, a convening of all the groups that care deeply to come up with a set policy. And lastly, I might say, USERF has said that this country ought to be a CPC country, yes. country of particular concern because of what they're doing. But it's, this is going to take more than just a, a statement. I think there needs to be action. Well, absolutely. We'll be looking for that action. We're so grateful for your leadership on USERF and also for your legacy leadership in Congress. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, Nicaragua is not the only country in Latin America where concerns of religious persecution have garnered international attention. Christians in particular have suffered from various forms of oppression in Cuba, Colombia and Mexico as well. The dictatorship in Cuba continues to tighten its grip on religious activity. According to USERF, the government uses tactics like surveillance, harassment of religious leaders and laity, forced exile, fines and imprisonment. While the majority of Colombians are Christian, most identifying as Catholic, many still suffer from persecution from paramilitary groups and Marxist guerrilla gangs. And in Mexico, anti-Catholic sentiment from the government dates back to 1917, when a new constitution was written outlawing religious teaching and public worship. While many of the restrictions have slowly lifted, it is still illegal for clergy to speak on political issues. The church also faces persecution from organized crime syndicates. EWTN News In Depth is following the developments of religious persecution in Latin America and other parts of the world. We will continue to shed a light on this important topic in the weeks and months to come. And there's much more ahead. A Pope Benedict anniversary, earthquake relief, 
a shrine dedication to an American martyr, and the beauty of Our Lady of Lourdes Grotto. We'll be back in a moment. This month marks the 10th anniversary of the papal resignation that shocked the world. This is the place where Josef Ratzinger, the later Pope Benedict XVI, was baptized in 1927. Coming up, I'll take a look back at the childhood of the German Pope. And Papst. If a pope is physically and mentally no longer able to carry out his office, then he not only has the right to resign, but also the duty to do so. His biographer explains the thinking of Pope Benedict XVI, ten years after he made history with his decision to resign. On February 11, 2013, Pope Benedict shocked the Catholic world with his announcement. He would leave the papacy weeks later. The impact is still being felt ten years later. On this anniversary of his resignation, we travel to his childhood home to better understand the upbringing that shaped the life of the German Pope. Rudolf Goering reports from Bavaria. When Pope Benedict died in Rome, the people of the Eternal City said that it was the second time he had made the city weep. The first time Rome wept because of the German Pope was almost 10 years earlier. On February 28, 2013, a snow-white helicopter left the Vatican territory with a man on board who had made history. Pope Benedict XVI had become the first pope in 700 years to resign from his office. The search for why he resigned leads us to Bavaria, where about two hours away from Munich lies the small town of Marktel am Inn. It was in this house that Josef Ratzinger was born on April 16th, 1927. Martel am Inn is only one of the many stations on this family's journey. There are some memories from how the very small Joseph celebrated Christmas here for the first and second time, how he stood in front of the Christmas tree with big eyes, how he also experienced the church here. He, the man of words, of books, learned to speak and to believe here, in the midst of a family that held together closely. This certainly also had a great impact on him from the beginning. Ratzinger was baptized the same night that he was born. The current bishop of Ratzinger's home diocese, Bishop Stefan Oster, recalls another place that had a great influence on the future pope. He said again and again, Altötting is my spiritual home. His most beautiful and earliest childhood experiences are in connection with Altötting. And he always said, and I think this is not insignificant for his spirituality, he learned the maternal dimension of the church through Altötting. And then, of course, he also processed and articulated that theologically. According to the Bavarians, Altötting is the most important place of pilgrimage in Germany. People have been making pilgrimages to the small town since 1489, and now a million pilgrims from all over the world come here every year. Just one year after his election as Pope, Benedict also returned there. When Pope Benedict celebrated the Holy Mass on September 11, 2006, here in Alt Othing, he went to pay his respects to Our Lady. And to the surprise of all of us, he placed his bishop's ring at Our Lady's feet. This is the ring that his siblings Mary and George had made from an ancient gem. It shows a dove with an olive branch as a symbol of peace. He wore this ring from 1977 until he was elected Pope. Since then, Our Lady wears it in her scepter. So above Our Lady's hand is the ring of Pope Benedict. In Marktl, we meet with Peter Seewald. He came closer to the Pope than any other journalist and published several books of interviews with Cardinal Ratzinger and later also with Pope Benedict. Seewald's extensive biography of the German Pope was published in 2020. Oh. 
It was a resignation with an announcement. Already in 2010, during our interview for the book Light of the World, I asked him if he had ever thought of resigning. And he said, not yet. At that time, there was also the Vati leak story, with regards to other things, and he said that one should not run away. You can only leave when everything is more or less back in order. He also said that for John Paul II, his time of suffering was part of his charism. For himself, however, he did not see it that way, nor did he want to repeat it. In 2010, he stated quite clearly that if a pope is physically and mentally no longer able to carry out his office, then he not only has the right to resign, but also the duty to do so. Has this decision damaged the papacy? Difficult question. If before it was true that the Vicar of Christ is taken away only by Christ himself, by God himself, he cannot decide for himself. It is very important to accept that Pope Benedict was seriously ill, not only because of his heart condition, not only because of his left eye which was blind, not only because of his constant headaches, he also had Parkinson's disease. He noticed that his memory was failing and above all, what he then revealed to me a few weeks before his death, that he had suffered from insomnia since 2005, already after the World Youth Day in Cologne. All these rumors that there were other reasons for his resignation, for example, fatty leaks, a conspiracy, or blackmail, and so on, all this is real rubbish and does not correspond to the truth. The truth is, he resigned for health reasons. He was rock solidly convinced that he would die before the end of 2013 after his resignation. The resignation was a relief for Benedict, says Peter Seewald, and he was careful about what he said about his successor, Pope Francis. I always tried as a journalist to get something out of him, and he said, no. In any case, he did not want to give the impression that he was kind of a shadow pope, commenting on the conduct of his successor in office. So there was nothing to get out of him, although of course it was clear that things like the withdrawal of the free access for the old Latin mass affected him deeply. Nevertheless, he vowed obedience to his successor before he could even know him. Yes, and he kept to that. The Pope is the Pope. There are not two Popes. To this day, the Vatican has no official regulations providing guidance should there be another papal resignation. But that future pontiffs could also resign from their office is now no longer unthinkable thanks to the Pope from this small Bavarian town whose decision revolutionized the papacy. According to Peter Seewald, Benedict never regretted his resignation. I last visited him on October 15, 2022. He was going through a difficult time because of his health problems, but also because of the attacks that never stopped. And I asked him, Papa Benedetto, what comforts you? And then he said, God keeps everything in his hands. From Bavaria, Rudolf Gerich, EWTN News in depth. When Pope Francis started his pontificate in 2013, he pre-signed a resignation letter in the event that he would ever become incapacitated and unable to perform his duties. However, in comments published just this week, he shared his current thinking on papal resignation. I believe that the papal ministry should be for life. I don't see a reason why it should not be this way. Historic tradition is important. If, instead, we listen to gossip, then we, we would have to change popes every six months. He added that resigning is not on his agenda. Still to come, top headlines in the Week in Review. Another shooting, this time on one of America's largest college campuses. More about an FBI report targeting Latin mass participants and the brave life of the Blessed Father Stanley Rother we remember. Ordinary people are called to holiness. That was one of the central teachings of the Second Vatican Council, the universal call to holiness. And I think Blessed Stanley Rother is a great, um, a great witness to that uh, foundational teaching that we're all called to be saints. The shepherd who didn't run. We go to this weekend's opening of a new shrine named in honor of the first U.S.-born priest to be martyred and beatified. 
And later, it's off to New York for the beginning of an encounter of faith drawing hundreds of participants closer to God. EWTN News In-Depth will be right back. An update about a deadly shooting at a major state college tops the week in review. The shooting at Michigan State University, one of the largest campuses in America, left three students dead and five in critical condition. The incident this week marked the 71st mass shooting in the U.S. since the beginning of the year. I'm tired of texting my friends and asking if they are safe. I want to go to college and I want to go and heal and grow. And I can't do that if things like this keep happening. A somber scene in East Lansing, Michigan this week. Students sat in protest outside the Michigan State Capitol on Wednesday. The college community held candlelit vigils to remember the three students who tragically lost their lives. Some students try to cope with their horror of their second school shooting and remember another deadly shooting at a community high school just 14 months ago. As the college community grapples with the loss, it seeks answers and healing. We know as a campus that we have hard work ahead of us. Moving forward won't be easy. None of us have all the answers, but we do have each other. We're going to go back into the classroom. We're going to create a space for students to talk. We're going to tell them it's okay to not feel okay. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to help them get the support that they need. With a slim majority in Michigan's legislature, many state Democrats hope to pass tighter gun laws to prevent another shooting. State Republicans seek to find common ground on laws focused on mental health services. Everybody that came here, expect a hell of a and what we're getting right now. Residents of East Palestine, Ohio, are demanding answers after a train carrying hazardous materials derailed and sparked a massive blaze two weeks ago. On Wednesday, the Norfolk Southern Train Company, responsible for cleaning up the site, failed to show up to a town hall meeting, citing security concerns. Are my kids safe? Are the people safe? Is the future of this community safe? Health and environmental concerns are mounting, despite an evacuation order being lifted and tests on water finding no contaminants. Officials say the toxic spill was largely contained, but many residents are staying elsewhere and questioning the validity of air and water tests. Thousands of dead fish were found in creeks in the town, and there are reports of farm animals and pets falling ill. At least two lawsuits have been filed against Norfolk Southern, including a class action suit. The numbers are grim as the death toll rises from the catastrophic earthquake and aftershocks in Turkey and Syria. The staggering number of dead nearing 44,000 as this weekend begins. Rescue and relief workers continue digging around the clock. Desperate Turkish rescue teams are now joined by international aid groups with additional expertise in disaster zones. Even greater challenges exist in Syria, which is more difficult for aid workers to access. One veteran rescue worker says the situation on the ground looks like Armageddon. Amid the devastation, more than a week after the earthquake, there are still sporadic rescue stories. Survivors pulled from the rubble against all odds. This 17-year-old girl was rescued from a collapsed building near the quake's epicenter. She said she had nothing with her to survive other than her wits and survived by distracting herself. And this miracle story. A 77-year-old woman rescued eight days after the quake, trapped alive in the rubble while lying on a sofa. The fallen concrete and steel floor of her apartment held up by the sofa just inches above her head. Her relatives were overjoyed she was found alive. Survivors of the quake still face harsh conditions. We're still dealing with you know, really basic needs, you know, water, food, shelter, uh, you know, psychosocial support, uh, you know, again, it's really cold there. So uh, blankets and winter clothes, those are what people are asking for. Those are what people are coming uh, asking for. 
John Coughlin is the team leader of emergency response for Caritas Internacionales, a, na a Catholic relief organization responding to the tragedy. We spoke to him on last week's program. Coughlin says this week his colleagues are visiting churches, mosques, and public schools, the main areas that are sheltering victims of the earthquake. Caritas records the needs of the people and then works to deliver assistance. Coughlin says those needs will require a long-term response. More Catholic response to a controversial FBI internal memo warning extremists might be trying to infiltrate and recruit so-called radical traditionalist Catholics. The memo was developed in the FBI's Richmond office and has since been retracted. According to the now disputed FBI report, radical traditional Catholics reject the validity of the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, generally prefer the traditional Latin Mass, and frequently follow anti-immigrant and white supremacy ideology. News of the FBI report has drawn harsh criticism from many Catholic leaders who reject FBI scrutiny of this small subset of Catholics and worry it could have repercussions for the larger number of traditionalist Catholics who also prefer the Latin Mass. Alarming, outrageous, offensive, ridiculous, scary, frightening, overreach. I mean, all of those, you, you pick the word. I can't imagine that the government is paying attention and concerned about who's going to worship and who's going to Eucharist. I mean, it just points out the profound divide that we're experiencing between government, religion, faith, politics. It's just, it's, it's absolutely outrageous. Bishop Barry nests out of the Richmond Diocese called on members of Congress to condemn the FBI memo, saying, if evidence of extremism exists, it should be rooted out, but not at the expense of religious freedom. A preference for traditional forms of worship and holding closely to the church's teachings on marriage, family, human sexuality, and the dignity of the human person does not equate with extremism. A momentous event in Oklahoma City on Friday morning as more than 30 Catholic bishops gathered for the dedication of the Blessed Stanley Rother Shrine. The 20th century missionary has been given a new resting place in a shrine built in his honor. Friday's dedication caps a week of events as the martyred priest's casket was moved into place and a mass was celebrated with members of his family. Beatified in 2017, Father Rother is entombed at the heart of the $40 million shrine, which includes a pilgrim center and museum. Reporter Alan Holdren brings us the story of a priest who lived and died for his faith and how his example continues to inspire others. Resurrection Memorial Cemetery has been Blessed Stanley Rother's resting place since 2017. When he was beatified then, he was moved here from his hometown cemetery in Ocarche, Oklahoma, and interred in this chapel in a private ceremony. The last time Blessed Stanley Rother's casket was seen by the public was at his burial in 1981. He had just been martyred. He served here in Oklahoma for several years, uh, various parishes throughout the state. And ultimately, he felt a call to go serve at the parish mission in Santiago, Atitlan, Guatemala. It was down there that he really flourished. He thrived. He really uh, fell in love with the people there and really discovered a heart for serving those people. And um, long story short, after several years down there, he was ultimately uh, murdered on July 28th, 1981. Some of the ways he was kind of uh, helping to develop their lives, the, uh, the government kind of saw it as a threat. Uh, even though he wasn't really a political person, he was kind of just there to um, bring Christ to the people that were down there who for centuries had lived down there without a regular parish priest. It's the Sunday before a shrine that bears his name opens in Oklahoma City, and the casket containing his mortal remains is being brought out of the tomb. Archbishop Paul Coakley, who has been instrumental in promoting Rother's cause for canonization, has been waiting for this day for a long time. Uh, we celebrated the beatification of Blessed Stanley in 2017, and it was at that time uh, that we began planning for a shrine for uh, him to, where he would be permanently uh, and finally uh, laid to rest, uh, a place of pilgrimage, a place where people could come to venerate him and uh, to seek his intercession. So it's been a long, long journey, uh, many, many years in the making. He just grew up 15 miles up the road here, and uh, so it's a, it's a very poignant time. Um, the people of Oklahoma have been very interested in the cause and um, in 
the construction of the shrine, and so it's going to be a, a big celebration uh, for all of us. 88-year-old Archbishop Emeritus Eusebius Beltran is also here. He knew Father Stanley Rother in life and promoted his heroic sanctity in death, making the push for his sainthood to one day be recognized by the church. I found him to be a very humble and devout man. I'm very pleased about this particular moment, but I'm looking forward to the actual canonization, hopefully to come soon. It'll take a verified miracle for that to happen, but the archbishops and many others are praying for it. En route to being interred in a chapel at his new shrine, Blessed Stanley's remains are brought to Oklahoma City's Cathedral of Our Lady of Perpetual Help for an all-night prayer vigil. The casket is wheeled into place, led by the men who have been moving his cause for canonization forward since 2007. The first family allowed in to pray is his own, the Rothers. It's an intimate moment. Shared by his sister, nieces, nephews, and cousins. It's a reunion, a chance to reminisce about Uncle Stan. We've learned a lot since his death and since we've grown up. And it's just, it's amazing looking back at, at, at the stories of people have told and, and it's just, it's amazing. He held on to those values when his life was put in danger is what really sticks out to me. What he stood for, I mean, that's a lot right there. Hundreds who never knew him in life, but have become closely acquainted with his fame of holiness turn out in his honor. Just thankful to, to be here and good things are to come through the shrine. Blessed Henry was testament of faith and his martyrdom was very inspiring to me and very crucial in my conversion. I'm just kind of excited for the whole thing. I'm, I'm hoping for the miracle that, and that we'll get him can, canonized. In the wee hours of the next morning at the massive new Shrine Church complex, Blessed Stanley's mortal remains are put in their final resting place. In a beautiful little chapel that remembers Rother and other martyrs for the faith is his new tomb, the altar itself. It's a fitting tribute to the first American-born martyr in Blessed. This is where the faithful will be venerating him from here forward, the Blessed Stanley Rother Shrine. Formerly a golf course, this sprawling 60-acre campus has a beautiful neo-colonial church, Stanley Rother Museum, and recreation of Mexico City's Tepeyac Hill, where Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to St. Juan Diego. The Archdiocese of Oklahoma City hopes that people will come from far and wide to receive the sacraments and to learn more about this heroic martyred priest from Ocarchi, Oklahoma. The shrine will be a point of encounter for Spanish and English speakers alike, with daily masses in each language, and a capacity for 2,000 people. Archdiocesan officials like Deacon Norm Maestrick are hoping Blessed Stanley's example will give a new impulse to the evangelization of all people in the U.S. Midwest. If I could speak with Blessed Stanley Rother, he would probably say, this is a lot of fuss for me. But he would probably also say, what an opportunity to lead people closer to God, which is what he did with his life. And so this is kind of an extension of his mission. He's not a recognized saint yet, but he sure is leading the masses to the house of God, the greatest mausoleum, shrine, and parish church in the state. In Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Alan Holdren, EWTN News In Depth. The opening of the Rother Shrine this weekend will help the Oklahoma City Catholic community in other ways. Two Spanish-majority parishes will close and the parishioners will now go to the shrine for regular masses and parish life. One of those parishes had been celebrating nine masses a day on Sundays in a school gym for the last 15 years. Now that parish will have a true home. We told you about this on last week's program. Two Super Bowl ads were coming, centered on the teachings of Jesus. Well, we saw them during the game. Did you? The nonprofit called He Gets Us called the ads, created the ads, which focused on being childlike in your faith and loving your enemies. <laughs> Oh, 
This year, a commercial during the year's most watched sporting event in the U.S. cost up to $7 million. The ads did what they were supposed to do, with a major spike in searches for the He Gets Us campaign and the term Christian Super Bowl trending on social media. While the ads also sparked criticism from some far left and far right pundits, a spokesperson for He Gets Us says the campaign is simply about reintroducing people to Jesus. The final score of the Super Bowl, 38-35. The Kansas City Chiefs over the Philadelphia Eagles. Also on last week's program, Bishop James Johnson of, the Kansas, of Kansas City and Archbishop Nelson Perez of Philadelphia made a little wager. So I'm going to place a wager to Bishop, Bishop Johnston of $500 to go to our Catholic charities or Catholic social services to serve those in need. So get your checkbook out, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, game on. I, I think I'll take you up on that wager, Archbishop Perez. Uh, that sounds like a With good, the uh, Chiefs coming out on top, Archbishop Perez is handing over $500 to Kansas City. And in good sportsmanship, Bishop Johnson gave a little thank you to Philly anyway. Looks like the Chiefs aren't the only ones who won. Thanks for your generous donation to Catholic Charities of Kansas City, St. Joseph. And I've offered also a donation to the Catholic Charities Appeal in Philly on behalf of Kansas City. Bishop Johnson says he hopes it inspires everyone to donate to worthy causes, especially as we head into Lent. You can watch the conversation between Archbishop Perez and Bishop Johnson as they made their wager in team gear on our EWTN News In-Depth social media channels. It was fun and had some pastoral advice. Next, Catholic worshipers gather in New York City to participate in this weekend's New York Encounter. Comments from Cardinal Timothy Dolan, plus insight from a top presenter there to inspire the faithful. When we're here, we meet Jesus because we're with the people who love him and believe in him. And because he gave us his word, where two or three are gathered, he'd be there in their midst. And that's what this is all about. A three-day event in New York City showcases speakers, exhibits, art, and more. An opportunity for people to gather, learn about Jesus, and to test everything and retain what is good in the words of St. Paul. Fiona Hawley is a communications coordinator and moderator at this year's New York Encounter. She joins us now to share more on this annual event. Fiona, thanks for being with us. New York Encounter kicks off on Friday. Tell us about what's happening right now, the energy there. So I was able to step into the event center um, just a few hours ago, and it's a bustle of activity, getting everything ready, um, setting up exhibits, um, and just lots of uh, energy from the volunteers who are getting everything ready. You're also a librarian in Wichita, Kansas. At New York Encounter, you're moderating an event that showcases the life of Father Emil Capon. We reported here on EWTN News In Depth when his remains were returned to the Diocese of Wichita. Tell us about your presentation. Yeah, so we were able to invite um, a journalist from Wichita Eagle, Roy Wenzel, um, who uh, covered that story um, and also wrote a book about Father Capon's life and um, what um, he meant to the survivors of the prisoner of war camp that he served with. Um, and we also have Father Matthew uh, Polakowski, who um, is a military chaplain for West Point. Um, and he also is a big promoter of Father Capon's cause for canonization um, and his story. And so both of them will be present. Um, and then we also have a recording of one of Father Capon's dear friends in that prisoner of war camp, um, Colonel Mike Dow. Uh, we were able to go to Houston or have somebody go to Houston and uh, do a recording for us um, with some questions that he was able to respond to just for the New York encounter. That really is truly an encounter of both courageous stories, but also the day-to-day -day life of Catholics. But it's not just Catholics who attend this event. How are other faiths welcome to this space? 
Yeah, in various uh, different years, there have been um, presentations on religious liberty and other um, talks that invite conversation with other faiths. Um, and it's always a really unique experience to bring people together um, of various backgrounds, both in our presenters and uh, speakers, but also the people who attend as well. They say iron sharpens iron, so people who hold their faith really dear will give other people the example of that. Has this been a great opportunity for evangelization as well? Are there particular audiences or demographics that you hope to attract this year? Well, it's always um, an adventure finding who discovers us and um, is interested in what we are talking about. There are always stories of people who come in off the street who um, we're just interested in um, seeing what we have to show them and um, to encounter a people with, um, and from um, communion and liberation, which um, helps prepare this event, um, to show a life in the church that is vibrant and interesting, that has something to offer everyone. And how has it grown over the years? Are there similar events in other parts of the country that you're competing with, or is this just a one-off that just happens year over year? Yeah, so it's grown. Um, I, in my opinion, I've gone um, for almost 10 years now, I've been involved, um, and it always seems so amazing how many people are there. And it feels like every year there are more and more people who are learning about it and hearing about it. Um, people from all over, the New York City area, but also from over the country who people have attended and told people about it. So uh, there are always new people who are learning about the encounter and we are always so excited to share that with them. Last question really quick, who am I? The theme for this year, the idea of identity. Is there something post COVID you're trying to lean into to bring people together? Yeah, I think there is the sense of after COVID there was, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk about isolation and um, coming out of that period in a period of polarization. So to encourage people to find um, that place where they encounter someone who can help them walk um, in their lives in a way that um, helps them to belong to something bigger than themselves and, um, and to really have that uh, journey that's beautiful. Well, we look forward to hearing more about what happens over the weekend and wish you well on this project. Thank you. New York Encounter is free and open to everyone. You can find out more about the three-day event at newyorkencounter.org. Our Father who art in heaven. And next, a pilgrimage to a grotto built in her honor on the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Images of the Week, next. Last Saturday, the church celebrated the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, as well as the World Day of the Sick. EWTN News In Depth was there as hundreds gathered at the National Shrine Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes in Emmitsburg, Maryland, to offer prayers and find healing and honor our Blessed Mother. We take you there as pilgrims refresh themselves from the grotto's fresh spring water. Enjoy our images of the week. Spirit of the soul, you have power, gives us strength in our 
A beautiful celebration of our Universal Church. If you're ever in the Washington, Baltimore area, we highly recommend a visit. And that does it for this edition of EWTN News In-Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Join us again next week, same time, as we explore news, events, people, and places important to your Catholic life. See you then.